Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, good morning. How many of you remember comedian Richard Pryor? Okay. Because he had a comedy routine about growing up poor, but it was actually more satire than comedy. And that routine has stuck with me over the years because I also grew up without much. And I had the opportunity um, on Thursday night to participate with Mindy McVeigh and her Hear Jane Roar um, experience and was asked to share you know, some of those stories and to hear some of the stories of the other women. It was very empowering. And, and it reminded me that, yeah, we have to remember that sometimes our comedians are actually satirists and they're trying to teach us a message. So I invite you to hear the prophetic truth in, in what became one of his very familiar routines. And he used to say, Richard Pryor used to say, he said, I used to think I was poor, but then they told me I wasn't poor, I was needy. Then they told me it was self-defeating to think that I was needy, I grew up deprived. And then it wasn't deprived, it was I was underprivileged. And then they told me that the word underprivileged was overused, so instead I was disadvantaged. And the comedian concludes, he says, I still don't have a dime, but I now have a great vocabulary. <laughs> and you can kind of hear the satire in that. And perhaps Richard Pryor, like many, he was laughing to keep from crying because whatever you call it, being poor is not funny. We live in one of the richest countries in the world, and no matter where you go throughout the country, these statistics will vary a little bit city by city, but countrywide, we have one in five children living in poverty every day. That statistic is from the Children's Defense Fund, and it hasn't changed much in like 30 years. We just haven't moved the needle. And as we see week after week, here at St. John's, particularly with our largest table community meal on Wednesdays, where we're serving upwards of 200 people, often their only hot meal of the week. I saw on Wednesday night our Under the Stars team. Those are some other churches who come and help us out outside the church, and they serve a meal. They started with like 25, and they had to grab me on Wednesday night to let me know they're up to 90 meals a week outside the church. People coming to get a meal and then getting take-home stuff and, and take home. They're getting take-home things and, and taking 90 meals because they just give one meal per person, but as much as you can eat. So we're seeing more need around the meal program on Wednesdays. We're seeing more meal, meals being distributed by Under the Stars, and we're also seeing every night people bundled up around our church building and in the city, more and more people. The most recent statistic I heard from Michelle Heritage, the executive director of the Community Shelter Board, is that every night in Columbus, there are 1,900 people, 1,900 people who do not have a home. 1,400 of those folks are placed in the shelter system or progressing through the shelter system, which if you do the math, I know some of you are mathematicians and have graduate degrees, if you do the math, that means 500 people a night in Columbus have no place to sleep, none. And that can cause challenges because being poor is a matter of life and death, but sometimes having people around your church at night and trying to ask folks to follow the rules and all of that can cause problems. So now I've been summoned to a meeting, nicely so, but I've been summoned to a meeting of some of the other downtown clergy who are worried about what's happening to their church property with folks who are homeless and around the church. And of course, we're one of the only churches that lets folks sleep overnight on our property because we've made the decision as a church that if the only place to lay your head safely at night is that concrete pad out there, well, as long as you follow the rules, it's yours. Because if you've ever spent a night on a concrete pad and a cardboard box, it's not very comfortable. And we've made that decision. So I'm very proud of our church for that. But I know our city is struggling with the demand because being poor is a matter of life and death. And it brings me to today's parable because in Luke, we're not given the luxury of being able to ignore what Jesus was teaching. And it is about the life and death consequences of what is called God's economy. 
Yet today's parable from Jesus is one of the least familiar to many churchgoers. How many of you have heard more than one or two teachings about this passage? If you've, uh, I've, got a few, I've got a few of you. How many of you heard this passage today for either the first time or it's been a long time? Yeah. Well, today's parable follows a, a discussion, if you look at the setting or the context, it follows a discussion between Jesus and the Pharisees about the love of money and the search for riches and true riches in life. And today's parable is really not difficult to understand, but it is difficult to hear because its meaning is clear, that riches cannot save us either in this life or the next. So today I'm gonna to do some teaching. I'm gonna try not to be too judgy so I can share a story about myself because the, the intent of this parable that Jesus was teaching was not to judge us, but to encourage us, to help us understand what's really important in this life. And I'm proud of how far our church has come. I'm proud of where we're going, and I hope each of you today will hear something that you can take to your lunches after church, that you can take to your afternoon discussions and devotions, and that will help you in the week ahead. But today's parable in the Gospel of Luke begins in a familiar formula of its time. It's not familiar anymore, but it was familiar at the time where Jesus sets up two worlds within two worlds. So if you're a seminary student, take some notes now because you might get an A on this when you go through this. We did some work on this. But see if you can stay with me while I do a little bit of teaching, because there are two worlds within two worlds. Jesus first describes the two physical worlds, the earthly life and the afterlife. And these two worlds are connected by the experience of death, this life and the afterlife. And woven within each of these two other worlds, this life and the afterlife, is the world of the have and the have-nots. Jesus has set up this two worlds within two worlds by saying there's this life and the afterlife, and within each of those, this life and the afterlife, you have haves and you have have-nots. Have -nots. You have the rich and the poor, you have the comforted and the afflicted. And Jesus sets the parable up with clearly defined boundaries between the worlds. So, some of you have, I've already lost you, I know. And we have to ask, how does this, like we do every Wednesday night in Route 66, how does this apply to us today? How does this confusing story and the worlds within two worlds, how does this have anything to do with us today? So I'm just going to share a story from my life that I hope you might be able to hear um, reflected in your life as well in some way. But some of you know that I practiced law for many years at Porter Wright, Morris, and Arthur, a law firm in Columbus, which is actually kind of just down the street that way. And I worked incredibly hard to overcome my family's limited means. I worked my way through college and law school on, on scholarship. And after I graduated from The Ohio State University College of Law, I accepted an offer to become a litigator over at Porter Wright. And I thought I had finally made it, working 80-hour weeks for a nice paycheck and finally being able to help my family. And this was back, I'm going to date myself now, but this was back in the 80s and 90s. Some of you are too young, you may not remember this time. But every day, if you remember that time, every day, I drove to work in my socially acceptable car, in my dress for success power suit and polished pumps, remember shoulder pads? And I drove to a big, tall building. I worked on the 30th floor, designed to house the offices of the city's power brokers. Every day, we had a chance to get outside at lunchtime, a chance to smell the fresh air, get a little sunshine, and walk for lunch in one of the nice, socially acceptable restaurants. And every day, as I walked with my power lunch group to our power lunch, I saw this peculiar beggar man on the corner of Broad and High Streets in Columbus. If you've been in Columbus for a long time, you may remember him. And I would pass him not once but twice, once on the way out of the office and once on the way back from the power lunch. 
And every day, everyone always remembered this particular beggar man because he had no legs or very little legs that I could see. And I always wondered if maybe he was a thalidomide baby because he had very little arms either. And he was dirty and smelly and drunk every day. He had that awful smell of alcohol seeping from his pores, especially on the warm days, and he had a goofy grin that was probably the result of the alcohol or some other high. And this legless beggar man used the proverbial tin cup to collect his alms for the day. He would just bang it on the concrete pavement to emphasize his plight, lest anyone try and ignore him. And most people did ignore the legless beggar man as they passed him by every day. He would bang that cup for hours. And others muttered rather loudly as they passed by that the city needed to ban panhandling in downtown Columbus because it was bad for business. And every now and then, my heart was moved by this man's plight. And along with others, I would put a dollar into that tin cup. And I would hold my breath in when I got close enough to the cup to ward off that, that awful, sweaty alcohol smell. And I would look straight at the cup because I wanted to avoid his gaze because I didn't want him to see me as much as I didn't want to see him. So with my arm outstretched from my body as far as possible, I would drop a dollar into that cup and turn and go away. And I was a big believer back then in that random acts of kindness. Have you heard of that random acts of kindness pathway to heaven? I thought that was the ticket. I was a big believer in random acts of kindness, one kindness dollar at a time. But today's parable makes plain that random acts of kindness by the affluent in the face of overwhelming poverty and suffering won't get us to heaven. And today we get to the bottom line of God's economy, the heaven, hell, bottom line consequences of being unconscious to the world around us, insulated in our daily lives from the plight of others. So I invite you to hear this parable again this time, as I mentioned, from the Cotton Patch Gospels, written by Clarence Jordan. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Clarence a little bit later. But the Cotton Patch Gospels, if you have any trouble wrestling with the Gospels, they are accessible, they're readable, they're written in a southern context, and I think you'll find them engaging. But the Cotton Patch Gospels transmits this parable in this way. And remember, this is Jesus teaching the Pharisees and, and all the people who had gathered. And the parable goes this way. Once there was a rich man, and he put on his tux and stiff shirt and, stated, and staged a big affair every day. And there was laid at his gate a poor man by the name of Lazarus, full of sores and so hungry that he wanted to fill up on the rich man's table scraps. And on top of this, the dogs would come and lick Lazarus' sores. Think about the rats that we have in Columbus. And some of our folks are so tired and sick, they won't even get up to shoo the rat away. It's icky to think about. But Clarence Jordan said, It so happened that the poor fellow died, and the angels seated him at the table with Abraham in heaven. And the rich man died too and was buried. And in the hereafter, the rich man in great agony looked up from hell and saw from afar Abraham and Lazarus sitting behind him at the heavenly table. So the rich man shouted, Mr. Abraham, please take pity on me and send Lazarus to dip his finger in some water and rub it on my tongue because I am scorching in this heat. And Abraham replied, rich man, remember that you will while you were alive, you got all the good things, the good jobs and schools and streets and houses, while at the same time, Lazarus got the leftovers. 
But now here, Lazarus has got it made, and rich man, you're scorching. And on top of all of this, in Jesus' teaching in the Cotton Patch Gospels, somebody has dug this yawning chasm, it means a space, this yawning chasm between us and you, so that people trying to get through from here to you can't make it, and neither can you get from there to us. And looking at the chasm, the rich man said, well, then Mr. Abraham, would you please send Lazarus to my father's house in the earthly world, for I have five brothers. Let Lazarus thoroughly warn them so that they won't too come to this hellish condition. And Abraham said, Mr. Rich Man, your brothers have got the Bible and the preachers. Let your brothers listen to them. But the rich man said, no, that won't do, Mr. Abraham. But if somebody will go to them from the dead, they will change their ways. And Abraham replied, well, if they won't listen to the Bible and they won't listen to the preachers, they won't be persuaded if, even if someone gets up from the dead. Now this parable about the rich man and Lazarus is rich in meaning, and it's susceptible to many, many different meanings. But fundamentally, it is about a barrier that did not get transcended, about a door that wasn't opened. On the one side was affluence and plenty, and on the other side was poverty and sickness. It was set up as a stark contrast between the haves and the have-nots in a culture that was 2,000 years removed from ours, and yet we still have the same problems. Now, the teaching point in this, and this is for our seminary students too, make a note, a telling point about this particular parable is that Lazarus the beggar man, remember this is Jesus telling a parable, this is not Lazarus, Mary and Martha's brother, this is not a person who is presumed to be a historical figure, this is a character who is named in Jesus' parable, teaching parable. And Lazarus the beggar man is the only character named by Jesus in his parables. Think about that for a minute. Jesus usually describes somebody, the, the woman who lost the coin, the dishonest manager, the story of the rich fool, the parable of the good Samaritan, the lessons of the prodigal son. We know certain people who are described in Jesus' parables, but Lazarus is the only person named by Jesus in his parables in any of the Gospels. That's really important. The only character referred to by name by Jesus in one of his parables is Lazarus, the ailing beggar man, who ate trash scraps while dogs licked his open sores. And Lazarus probably smelled pretty bad too. So I did a little more research on this, and I learned that the name Lazarus in this context means God helps and God helped Lazarus in the end and securely seated him next to Abraham in the afterlife. But for those like me who were ignoring the poor with random acts of kindness, well, the story's telling us that we're going to hell like the rich man. And that was the bottom line of God's economy. But this parable, and here's the hook for the seminary students, this parable really isn't about the afterlife and focusing on whether or not we're going to heaven or hell. This story is about this life. And I'm really grateful to some of the preachers and writers and teachers who over the years have helped me to understand this because this story is about what we do or don't do with the wealth and abundance with which we have been gifted. Because it is easy to come up with excuses to get around the economic implications of this parable. Some will say that, well, we can't feed and take care of all the poor, it's impossible, so why try? And others will blame the victim and will look at Lazarus critically, asking why he didn't assert himself more and knock on that barrier door and bang his cup and ask for help. If he had done that, said the rich man, made himself and his need known, well, then maybe we could have helped him, but unless he comes in that door and lets us know. But I've learned that perhaps what we're called to do is answer back and say, Mr. Rich Man, why were you not out hunting the street for someone who was hurting? 
Instead of resting securely in your gated community or your massive church, oblivious to the world's needs. And that's some of the work we've been doing, thinking about how do we better use this sacred space with which we have been gifted to make our church a church of the city and to better need, meet the needs of those who are suffering. Read our e-newsletter. We're doing some wonderful things to move forward in that regard. But in this parable, Jesus' parable, the rich man doesn't get it, even in the afterlife. He continues to miss the connection, and this is also for our seminary students. Note that even in the afterlife, the rich man asked Abraham to send Lazarus to fetch water for him. And what we see in that is that the rich man, even in the afterlife, fails to see Lazarus. He fails to see Lazarus, his neighbor. He fails to see Lazarus as Christ in wretched disguise. He fails to see Lazarus as his salvation. And today, through this parable, we are getting the warning that the rich man wanted to send to his five brothers before it was too late. And we are getting the chance to make it right. Because this parable isn't meant to blame or shame or be judgy or, or meant to make us feel bad. It's like Pastor Mary said, it's our wake-up call, it's our alarm. Because what we learn from the parable is that for the rich man, the wake-up call came too late. But we have the chance to change our bottom line every day and to manifest God's kingdom here on earth. Some of you may not know Jurgen Moltmann. He wrote a great book called The Theology of Hope, along with a lot of other theological books. Anybody other than my seminary students here know of Jurgen Moltmann? Well, I'll, I'll, I will skip many decades of philosophical work, and I will tell you that he got it right. Jurgen Moltmann got it right when he said that the opposite of poverty is not property. The opposite of both is community. Think about that for a minute. The opposite of poverty is not property. The opposite of both is community. For the rich man in today's parable, his hope and his salvation and life had literally been right outside his door. And Jesus was teaching us that the beggar man was our neighbor and our salvation. So let me give you one more current example to, to really help put this in context. You remember that I mentioned Clarence Jordan. In the South, it's Clarence Jordan. But Clarence Jordan was the author of the Cotton Patch Gospels. Anyone else know who Clarence Jordan is? Raise your hand if you know who he is. A few of you know who he is. In 1942, so put this in context, in 1942, Clarence Jordan put the living gospel to the test when he founded Koinonia Farm outside America's Georgia in the Deep South. Blacks and whites lived together there, embodying the kind of community described by Luke in the book of Acts, where fellowship, or koinonia in Greek, meant a communal sharing of goods. And that's a restored photo. That's an actual photo of some of the folks from koinonia farms, and that's, that photo's been restored. But this was 1942 in the South, and the Ku Klux Klan terrorized and bombed koinonia. Now, many people were impacted by Clarence Jordan and his work, including a man named Millard Fuller, a wealthy man. Anyone know? He might be a little more familiar to you. Yes, some of you know Millard Fuller. And the story is told that when Millard Fuller met, met Clarence Jordan, he told Mr. Jordan at Koinonia Farm that he felt a tremendous heaviness in his chest. And Mr. Jordan responded with a wink in his eye that, well, a million dollars can weigh heavily can weigh heavily on a man. <laughs> he said the quote was a million dollars can weigh awfully burdensome on a man, Millard. Mr. Jordan suggested to Miller, Mr. Fuller to his face that he was a money act, addicted to money. Have you ever heard that phrase? That he was a money act, addicted to money. And it's because Clarence Jordan's philosophy was about money was as follows. He said, what the poor need is not charity, but capital. Not caseworkers, but co-workers. And what the rich need is a wise, 
honorable, and just way of, div of divesting themselves of their overabundance. Stark words, especially at that time. But after hearing this, Millard Fuller thereafter was so impacted that he honorably divested himself of his wealth. Millard Fuller broke down the door between the haves and the have-nots. He broke down the barrier to his salvific community when he founded a ministry called Habitat for Humanity. Now, how many of you have heard of Habitat for Humanity? There you go. That's the impact of honorably divesting oneself of one's wealth to engage in a ministry that makes a difference in our world. Many of you have worked on Habitat homes, homes for the working poor in our community, breaking down those barriers between the haves and the have-nots. It's like Jurgen Moltmann said, the opposite of poverty, the opposite of wealth, is community. And we are called by God to live on this earth in community. When we hear this parable story together as we did today, we discover that we are actually all poor, or maybe that we are all really rich. But what we lack is community. Which takes me back to the corner of Broad and High in Columbus, to the legless beggar man back then who smelled, and the beggar man who apparently was going to heaven while I was destined for hell in my power suit and my fistful of kindness dollars. And I wondered how can I, one imperfect person, do anything other than offer scraps from the table on Wednesdays and some kindness dollars here and there. And I learned from author Robert Fulgham, remember that book, All I Ever Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten? If you don't have it on your bookshelf, I recommend it. It's great. But I learned from Mr. Fulgham that we were all given a hint about how to answer this question by a little old Yugoslavian woman who wore a blue sari and sandals and who showed me back then in my power suit how important it is to wake up before it's too late like it was too late for the rich man. And like Fulgham, I disagreed with this Roman Catholic nun on fundamental issues like birth control and the place of women in the world and in the church. But I did learn that you can learn from people you disagree with. Did you know that? You can learn from people you disagree with, despite what social media might be trying to tell you today. Because the wealth of this nun's compassionate spirit, it cut through a world of lawyerly cynicism when I heard her speak. Just cut through it all. And with only the tool, she's like this high. I'm short and she's maybe half my height. With only the tool of uncompromising love at her disposal, she made manifest our capacity for healing humanity's wounds. She made the story of the Good Samaritan a living reality. And she lived so true a life as to shine out from the back streets of Calcutta throughout the entire world with a courage and a faith that we dare not admit in ourselves, and yet we cannot live without. I did not speak the language of this nun, yet the eloquence of her life spoke to me, and Fulgham helped us put words to what we were experiencing. We were chastised and blessed at the same time. We could not believe that one person could do so much in the world. Now, I did not believe in her version of God, but the power of her faith astonished me. And Mother Teresa, how many of you have heard of Mother Teresa? She was clear about what her faith and her moral activism required when she said we can do no great things, only small things with great love. Many of us have been impressed by that quote. Mother Teresa saw Christ, the beggar man, lying in wretched, wretched disguise at her door, and she opened the door and invited him in. And when he came in, a host of other people came in with him, people defined not by property, not by poverty, but as a community. And sometimes we are saved together in community in this life, and that's the bottom line of God's economy. Thanks be to God. Amen.